It is Friday. You know what that means. Notable quotables. I managed to get him with one hand on the gun, and then I grabbed it from him, and I threw it over the countertop. There's a gruesome scene. It's really bad out there. I couldn't believe what I seen, man. It was like, oh, man. Everybody, all these people on the streets getting hit one by one. To be in, in that dugout where there's still the marks of the bullet holes there. We are vindicated. We are validated. We are not shutting up and we're not going away. I'm going to be on another network tomorrow that thinks I should be in jail. Thank you for your patience and your good questions. Thank you. Kim Jong Un was, uh, he really has been uh, very open, very honorable. Facts are facts and fiction is fiction. And a lie doesn't become truth just because it appears on the front page of the newspaper. It's pretty historic to send a Secretary of State to the floor without a positive recommendation. I have changed my mind. I mean, yes. In the White House, they call him the candy man. I said to Dr. Jackson, what do you need it for? I said, what do you need this for? But I said, what do you need it for? I said to him, what do you need it for? Are you wearing it? <laughs> um, I don't even know. Sure. Are you wearing it? <laughs> I like him a lot, but we do have a very special relationship. Be, we have to make him perfect. He is perfect. Look at how nice your parents are being. I can't believe it. They're not screaming and they're not going wild. I have known Kanye a little bit and I get along with Kanye. We are both dragon energy. <laughs> I'm telling you, caffeine drink. Watch out. Dragon energy. Well, we have some energy coming up. Tuesday is a big event. We're going to West Virginia, Morgantown, Martha McCallum and me. A big debate for the GOP U.S. Senate race and the primary there. It's going to be fun. That's it for us. It's fair, balanced and unafraid. And the story hosted by Martha McCallum starts right now. Martha, you getting those questions ready? I am. I am. We're looking forward to that. Brett, thank you so much. So there are some stunning scenes that we are all absorbing. Look at this. Talk about a love week, right? Kim Jong-un and President Moon hopping over the concrete divider. Brand new details on President Trump's plans now for the next move in this high stakes game of global chess. But first tonight, breaking here, the Mueller probe draws ire from a prominent Democrat. Mark Penn, a longtime Clinton advisor and supporter, writes this. The best way to end all this is not to fire Mueller or Rosenstein or wait for them to wrap it up, but to challenge this entire process in court as irretrievably tainted. Penn would find agreement from the House Intel Committee and the president. We were honored. It was a great report. No collusion, which I knew anyway. No coordination, no nothing. It's a witch hunt. As I've said many times before, I've always said there was no collusion, but I've also said there has been nobody tougher on Russia than me. So in moments, we will hear from Mark Penn on this fascinating editorial that he wrote. But first, Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry live in Washington with the very latest on all this from there tonight. Hi, Ed. Martha, great to see President Trump wrapping his arms around this Republican finding to again declare today that all of these Russia investigations are a hoax. In his words, he wants them to end, though there are no signs that special counsel Robert Mueller's probe is wrapping up anytime soon. Nonetheless, the president feels ahead of steam, as you heard there, because this report of over more than 250 pages by Chairman Devin Nunes and other Republicans on the House Intel panel asserts they, quote, found no evidence that the Trump campaign colluded, coordinated, or conspired with the Russian government, though the panel did, quote, find poor judgment and ill-considered actions by the Trump and Clinton campaigns. On that point about Hillary Clinton, it was her campaign and the DNC that used intermediaries to hide their roles in paying for the anti-Trump opposition research from Russian sources that became the Steele dossier. None of those facts, though, stopped Democrat Adam Schiff today from insisting there's been a pattern of what he called deception from Team Trump about their contacts with Russians that, in his words, suggests, quote, wrongfulness, if not illegality, the type of broad attack that has led Republicans like Trey Gowdy to call out Schiff for not delivering on alleged collusion. Watch. I think Adam Schiff in March of 2017 said he had evidence more than circumstantial, but not direct. And oh, by the way, there is no body of evidence that's more than circumstantial, but not direct. But he said he had it of collusion. And we've been waiting for, for over a month, now, for over a year now, for him to actually produce that, that evidence. It was totally conclusive, strong, powerful. Uh, many things said that nobody knew about and said in a very strong way. 
Uh, they were very forceful in saying that the Clinton campaign actually did contribute to Russia. Now, Republicans also suggesting former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, had a role in leaking the anti-Trump dossier, declaring that Clapper, now a paid CNN contributor, provided, quote, inconsistent testimony to the Intel Committee about his contacts with the media, including CNN. And at a news conference with the German chancellor today, the president offered a new line of attack on the Russia probe, saying he called Rear Admiral Ronnie Jackson today, told him he's an American hero for exposing how nasty the swamp can be with anonymous allegations that, in his case, sunk his cabinet post, the president saying the same things happened to him with what he called the Russian collusion hoax. Martha? And thank you very much. Joining me now, Mark Penn, former advisor to Bill and Hillary Clinton. Mark, good to see you this evening. Thank you for being here. Um, you heard from Adam Schiff. Uh, Democrats clearly believe that there is a major issue here with Russia, but you feel, based on what you've seen so far, that these are what you call in your piece fruits of a poisonous tree. Explain. Well, look, I, I spent a year fighting Ken Starr, and I think any reasonable person looking at what happened here says this investigation had no foundation, and whatever foundation it had was not only wrong but corrupt. Uh, I, I think Christopher Steele was, was part of the FBI when he leaked, lied, and then was fired. Page and Strzok are clearly biased. The head of the FBI was clearly biased. The head of the CIA appeared to be doing illegal leaks as well. This whole thing was corrupt. There is a doctrine called the fruits of the poisonous tree that says when investigations get started like this, when searches and seizures are done on this basis, they should be thrown out. I think that's probably the best way to stop this thing, because otherwise we're going all the way to the end. And I don't think we should waste another year here. So one of the things that uh, many point to when they say that, you know, they look at, at this, this, the origins of this, if they don't see it in the Carter Page you know, category. They see it in the discussion that Papadopoulos had. And, and you feel like that that's a pretty tenuous limb to hang this fruit on, so to speak. Well, look, Devin Nunes says there was no official intelligence. And he's now looking at the State Department. That suggests what happens here is that one of Hillary's aides, who, who I know well, but I'm not going to mention names, passed this on to the State Department from an Australian diplomat who helped fund a $25 million contribution to the, to the Clinton Foundation, who's reporting a conversation that he had about a conversation that someone else had, who, who was a Maltese professor, who then had it supposedly with Russian agents, which showed no collusion in the first place. Now, what nonsense is it to start the world's most significant investigation with all of the resources of the government and the country on the basis of this? It's ludicrous. So you clearly think that it, it's valid, and it's the underpinning of this question, what Brett Baer asked this last night to James Comey. Did, you know, were you interested in knowing where, who was funding this, this research, this oppo research? And he said, well, you know, not really. I mean, did, did, did that strike you as odd, Mark? Well, considering in a previous interview, he said that he, I thought, he said that he did not tell the president that it was funded by the DNC and Hillary, implying when he answered that question that he knew it. I think when he got to the Brett Baer interview, he was giving really, I think, really ducking the questions and giving slimy answers. Oh, he didn't know who it was paid for to this day. That just was not true. And if it was true, how could he have used this information to launch this investigation? It's preposterous. And here he is out making millions of dollars off a book for a few meetings. Look, I met with the Clintons over 400 times. I never wrote a book, uh, a, a kiss and tell book like this. It's, it's ludicrous. It's profiteering. Uh, who knows the validity? of these stories. So you, you have an interesting tactic that you think the White House should initiate, and that is to say that this investigation is tainted and to take that to court. Yeah, I, I look, I think they're on pure defense and they need some offense and they can't fire Mueller. 70 percent, nearly 70 percent of the people of the last Harvard Caps Harris poll say don't fire them. Mm. But they do believe there was bias. I think they should go prove, say there's bias. This, this investigation has to be thrown out and they should get discovery of all of these things. They need an offense, not just defense. Fascinating. Mark Penn, thank you very much. Great to have you here tonight. Thank you. So dueling editorials this evening, my next guest is issuing a warning to President Trump over how he's handling this probe. In a new piece in The Wall Street Journal, Kim Strassel writes this. Trump can define the terms of this debate 
and defend the executive branch, and he can enlighten the country, but his time for doing so productively is growing very short. Wall Street Journal columnist Kim Strassel joins me now. Kim, good to see you tonight. Thanks for being with us. Um, hi, Martha. Hi there. You know, so you, you basically say that they have to approach this from a constitutional perspective. Explain. Well, we were just talking about how there seems to be no there there on the collusion question. The House report is now out. By all reporting, Mr. Mueller has not found anything there either. And so the reports now say he's moving to the question of obstruction of justice. That requires an entirely new legal approach, one that goes right at that constitutional question. Because you talk to any constitutional lawyer, they will say that a president cannot be construed to have obstructed justice while he was in the process of engaging in core constitutional powers. And that includes firing subordinates and directing law enforcement like Mr. Comey. You know, one of the things that I find interesting, we haven't heard directly, obviously, from, from Robert Mueller on this, but one of his uh, spokespeople said something to the effect of, you know, when you read about what we're doing, don't necessarily believe everything that you read because we're not leaking about what we're doing in this special counsel uh, investigation. And, you know, it, it, and they also said that they will issue at the end of it a report. You know, that, that's what this is leading up to. This is not leading up to some sort of indictment. It's leading up to Mueller releasing a report, probably along the lines of what we heard James Comey do uh, back in July before the, before the election, to say, here's what I looked at. This kind of looks like it could be obstruction of justice. This looks like it could be whatever. You know, I, who know nobody knows what he's going to say. But what's the, what's the process there? I mean, what do you expect to come out of that report once it, once it, it hits the air? Well, we have no idea because they have been relatively quiet on exactly what that report will look like. But this is why it's so important for the Trump team of uh, Trump lawyers to go to a federal court, get a declaratory judgment from that court that does make the point that presidents cannot be held for obstruction when exercising core functions. You put the special counsel on notice that that is not an area that his report should go because it's not a constitutional question. And you could also potentially shut down this discussion that is now you know, just everywhere in the press and among Democrats as well, too, because it's beginning to impede on other presidential uh, abilities like impeachment. Or, I'm sorry, like pardons. He came out and pardoned Scooter Libby. And, and you have all these Democrats saying, well, that's obstruction. He gives an order to his attorney general. They say it's obstruction. So this is an issue that just needs to be clarified one way or the other. All right. So, you know, uh, folks who are very concerned that there was some serious wrongdoing here are pointing mostly to the Michael Cohen part of the investigation, that these recordings that are on his several cell phones that he had are likely to lead down some road they believe that will entrap the president in, in some wrongdoing. Uh, the other issue that seems to be very much in the forefront is this meeting at, at Trump Tower. Um, you know, when you look at, at what you've learned about those situations, how does that play into how you see the larger picture here or does it? Well, the meeting at Trump Tower, if you look through this House Intelligence report that just came out today, everybody involved in that was investigated, questioned, and the finding was that uh, they essentially had this meeting. They thought it was going to be about something else beside it was. There was no collusion in the end. Again, this was why we supposedly had the special counsel was questions of collusion. And, and it, they seem to have been exonerated on that point by this House Intel report. The Michael Cohen thing, I'm not sure where that goes in any direction because it's just not clear where exactly special counsel is looking. Is this a question of a campaign finance violation? Is there some suggestion that there was extortion? that the president was aware of this. We just don't know. But what I will say is that we do seem to be very far afield from the original orders that the special counsel was given by Rosenstein. Thank you very much, Cam. Good to see you tonight. Thanks. Coming up, Brett Baer and I will host the West Virginia Senate GOP primary debate coming up on this Tuesday night. But tonight we're going to give you a little preview when the West Virginia native, known to some as the Dark Lord of Coal and other names, joins us in a moment plus a hop over the curb that could be the beginning of the end what is behind the dear leader's smile in south korea general jack keen joins me next this is beyond the united states this is a world problem and it's something that i hope i'm able to do for the world
I want to congratulate the Republic of Korea on its historic summit with North Korea. We're encouraged by President Moon and Kim Jong-un's expressed goal of complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So that was President Trump praising the outcome of a historic meeting between South Korean President Moon and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Today, this. Look at these pictures. I, I just can't get over it. It's really an amazing moment. What will come of it, nobody really knows. But today, they signed this joint declaration to end the seven-decade war and to pursue what they are calling complete denuclearization of the peninsula, the landmark peace deal giving the United States hope that President Trump can find the same success in his summit with the rogue regime when they meet next month. We get a kick every once in a while out of the fact that uh, I'll be watching people that failed so badly over the last 25 years explaining to me how to make a deal with North Korea. I get a big, big kick out of that. But uh, we are doing very well. I think that uh, something very dramatic could happen. Interesting. Today, from the president, now General Jack Keane, chairman of the Institute for the Study of War and a Fox News senior strategic analyst. Uh, good to see you, General, as always. Yeah, good I to mean, see you, Martha. You have remarked uh, quite a bit on the unprecedented nature of what we have seen over the last month and a half. I I'm wondering what went through your mind when you saw those images that we just had on the screen. Yeah, it's really quite stunning. I mean, we have talked on this, on your show, going all the way back when Trump announced his new policy about why we can't trust them, and et cetera. And we've articulated that in depth. But what is taking place in front of us, this incredible sense of urgency that Kim Jong-un has displayed going back to the Olympics when it started with South Korea, and he invited himself to the present. It is extraordinary and somewhat unprecedented. It reminds me of the sudden and unexpected collapse of the Soviet Union when the wall in Berlin went down. That's the, that's the pace of the, what this is moving at. And you, it's hard to process all of it, to be frank. And the next logical step, just dealing with the summit with the moon uh, that's taking place today and finishing up tomorrow, I think, uh, is this. After they sign a peace treaty, North Korea, South Korea, China, and the United States, the next logical step would be to pull those very large armies yeah. that have been standing off against each other for one of the longest standoffs in history, pull them away from each other because they're both on the border, the majority of those armies. And that would be a major un historic step forward as well. Clearly, Kim Jong-un is setting a framework because... The meeting with Moon came first, and now the meeting with Trump, clearly to put on a table denuclearization in his terms. And I think he probably would like to denuclearize if he's serious, and we won't know until the president gets in the meeting. If he's serious, he would like to drag that out over a period of time and start making concessions almost immediately. The president won't let him get away with that. He's going to want to do it as rapidly as we possibly can with complete verification. If he's not serious at all, I take the president at his word he's going to go up, get up and leave. But this much I believe. I think the president has inside information here that he's not sharing with us about what's going on with Kim Jong-un. And I think he got that from Director Pompeo in his discussions with him. Because he keeps talking about something dramatic, but if it doesn't happen, I'm going to leave. But we, we got a, a major event coming, but if it doesn't work out, we're going to leave. Yeah. He has some information he's not telling us. Fascinating. Um, you know, when you look back at it, and I, and I think that analogy of um, the Berlin Wall and, and uh, Gorbachev is, is really fascinating. And, but when you kind of peel back that moment, you ask yourself, with a viewpoint to history, what was the straw that sort of began to break the camel's back? And I think of the talks that President Trump and President Xi had and the increasing sanctions and the pressure. There, there is evidence that the pressure economically on North Korea has been much more dramatic than it has been in the past. And, and that there are some elements of North Korean society, there is this small upper echelon that is connected to the leadership there, is not happy with the way things that are going, the way things are going in North Korea. And perhaps those initial meetings with President Xi set this ball in motion? Oh, yeah, I'd absolutely believe it. And remember, the Soviet Union collapsed largely for economic reasons. They mm -hmm. just couldn't keep up with the Cold That's War right. anymore. And, and there was so much large disenchantment inside the country that the leaders said, hey, we got to change. Mm -hmm. I think the economic pressure, absolutely, you're right on the mark with that. I also think 
And, and China's pivotal here, as you, as you indicate. But I also think there's absolute belief in China and in, in North Korea and South Korea and, and with the Japanese that the president is dead serious about the use of military force if, if this comes down to no other option. I think that they're convinced that the United States has a plan to take out their nuclear systems and take out their ballistic systems as much of their artillery as, as, as possible. And they have seen the president take action with, with limited military force. And I think he's got credibility when he makes that statement that I'm prepared to use military force if you leave me no other option. So you put China together, the economic pressure, President Trump's military option, but mostly the reason why we're going through this, and we've got to give them the credit for it, is because of President Trump. That's that's the reality of it. Interesting to watch, to be sure. General Jack Keane, thank you, sir. Always great to yeah. see you. Thanks for being here yeah. tonight. Yeah, good talk. So coming up, Senate candidate Don Blankenship says that he was basically Trump before Trump was Trump, and that his time in prison is a, quote, badge of honor. He is here to explain. Plus, the Fixer Upper stars under fire for saying that they're family first and successful. Can you be both? Somebody says no. We'll talk about it with Rachel Campos Duffy when we come back. My life is just crazy. It's spontaneous. It's fun. It's filled with a lot of different hats. Hit on Tuesday night, live from West Virginia, ahead of the Republican Senate primary there, which is a really interesting race, very competitive. Uh, the winner of that will take on Democratic Senator Joe Manchin in November, a seat that Republicans would love to pick up. The three candidates polling at 10 percent or higher will be participating, and we have invited them to appear here on the story as well. We'll be joined by businessman Don Blankenship in just a moment. But first, correspondent Peter Ducey on why this West Virginia race is being so closely watched around the nation. Hi, Peter. Martha, the reason the stakes are so high in coal country is that the Republican who wins the West Virginia Senate primary gets on a ballot against a Democratic incumbent, Senator Joe Manchin, in a state where President Trump beat Hillary Clinton by 42 points. That makes it one of the Republicans' best opportunities to flip a seat. A Fox News poll finds the top three are Congressman Evan Jenkins, Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, and a former coal baron Don Blankenship. But a quarter of likely voters are undecided, and 41 percent might change their minds. There is a fight between Jenkins, the congressman, and Morrissey, the AG, over who has been the most helpful to President Trump. Jenkins brags that he was the only one to endorse Trump in the presidential primaries and the only one in D.C. right now casting votes to advance the Trump agenda. While Morrissey argues he's been doing more to help Trump by filing lawsuits to undo unfair Obama-era energy regulations seen as coal killers and some lawsuits that are reigning in the opioid epidemic. In third place... It is the former coal baron, Don Blankenship, known best as the contender who just did a year in jail on a misdemeanor conviction of conspiring to violate mine safety laws after 29 miners were killed in an explosion at his company's Upper Big Branch Mine. That baggage has some race watchers comparing Blankenship to Roy Moore, who disappeared from the campaign trail in Alabama when allegations of sexual misconduct surfaced. But Blankenship tells me there's a big difference because Moore's accusers were women and his accusers were Obama allies, with the suggestion being that he was punished by an administration with an unfavorable view of coal. Now some nervous Republican-linked super PACs are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars against the Republican Blankenship to try to keep him off the ballot, but he's spending millions of his own. Martha. Peter, thank you very much. A Washington Post columnist recently summed up the West Virginia primary, saying this, if the 2018 midterm election were a season of The Apprentice, we would already have a front runner to beat out everyone else. Don Blankenship, fresh out of prison, who stands a decent chance of becoming West Virginia's next Republican nominee for the Senate. So here now, Don Blankenship, West Virginia Senate GOP candidate and former Massey Cole CEO. Uh, sir, thank you very much. Good to have you with us tonight. Thank you. So why do you think at this point that you are behind in the polls? And do you think that it's because you did recently spend time in prison? Well, I think I'm behind in the polls because uh, Senator McConnell has uh, got a super PAC that's uh, running, I think, a million and a half dollars worth of ads against me. But, uh, you know, we were even before that and uh, before Election Day will be even or ahead. 
So speaking of uh, Senator McConnell, you made a comment uh, over the course of this week that got quite a bit of attention. Let, let's play that, and then you can talk about your relationship with him. I have an issue when the uh, father-in-law is, uh, you know, is a wealthy China person, and uh, there's a lot of connections to some of the brass, if you will, in China. Well, I don't have anything against his wife. I mean, I, I just saying that uh, it's her uh, father that is uh, well connected in China. So I spoke with uh, Senator McConnell on other topics the other night, but we wanted to get his reaction to that. He basically did not respond directly to what you said, but here's what he said. Who do you support there? I'm not in that race, uh, but I hope they nominate somebody who can actually win the general election. All right. So that, that kind of breaks down into two questions for you, sir. The first one is about the China person comment. What were you suggesting by that? Well, I think President Trump is considering tariffs, and uh, we all know that the trading relationship with China is the biggest trading relationship we have, and we need to make sure that the decisions on that uh, trade agreement are uh, done in America's best interest and no personal best interest. It's no different than any corporation or any business entity. You want to make sure you don't have conflicts of interest in those decisions. There's no accusation there. It's just that it's important that everybody be doing what's best for the country. So you say there's no accusation, but you pointed out that that, that uh, Mr. McConnell's wife is uh, the daughter of a prominent former Chinese businessman. Um, so that suggestion, it sounds like you're suggesting that he has a conflict of interest because of that. Is, is that what you were suggesting? Well, yes. I mean, I'm not suggesting there's a conflict of interest in any business world that would be a conflict of interest. It's just a matter of whether, you know, it would impact, impact his uh, decision making or his position on his issues. He has in the past taken some strange positions. For example, after Tiananmen Square, he was one of the senators that uh, was in favor of letting trade continue with China despite their human rights violations and voted in that manner. So he's had uh, votes and so forth uh, relative to China that one could question. But the, the base issue here is that businesses are always concerned about conflict of interest when they're negotiating understood. deals. I, I and only, in this case, we yeah, just need to be aware understood. of it. Uh, I, I want to just ask you about West Virginia before I let you go, because we're going to run out of time. In terms of, the, you know, they're last in business, according to Forbes, and first in opioid use. Why are you the best person to turn your state around? Well, one thing is I've not been given the chance to turn it around that my two opponents have, and one of them lobbied for drug companies, and the other one is uh, representing and has represented for 20 years the city that's worst in the nation per capita in uh, opiate drug deaths. So uh, it's not uh, easy to tell the difference. I've not had that opportunity, but at the company I ran, we were drug-free. We were very tough on drugs. This country needs to be very tough on drugs, and that's what I'll be. All right. We're going to have more chance to talk to next Tuesday night. I thank you very much for being here, sir. And we'll see you Tuesday. Don Blankenship, many thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. Bet. As I said, coming up on Monday, West Virginia Republican Senate candidates Patrick Morrissey and Evan Jenkins, who are running against Mr. Blankenship and who will be with us on Tuesday night, will be here to share their story. Chris Starwalt joins me now with his thoughts on all of this. He knows all of politics really well, but West Virginia politics particularly well. Um, your mm -hmm. thoughts on what we're looking at here, Chris? Uh, uh, a goat roping uh, <laughs> and a good one. A uh, fascinating one. Uh, I love this race. And uh, we're seeing the same narrative play out in West Virginia uh, that we are in Indiana and elsewhere around the country as candidates try to position themselves as the Trumpiest. Who can out Trump Trump? And in this race, all of them have tried. But the reason that it's still competitive for Blankenship is that he has made a pretty convincing case to Republican voters in West Virginia. He's a businessman. You talk about outsider. That's outside. Uh, and all of that stuff. And that's why they're still these folks are still sticking with him. And that's why this is still anybody's race. Yeah. When you look at the polls, Chris, how reflective do you think they are at this point? I know it's always tough to to do in a primary race um, in the early stage of the game. But, you know, what's your sense of West Virginia? Well, it's the best state. But other than that, uh, my sense is that you're going to have about 100,000 or 110,000 people. That's it voting in this. This is going to be a low turnout, relatively low turnout 
primary election among Republicans in a state that is histor that was historically Democratic. Uh, what matters here, these are the most intense voters. These are the people, these are the activists, this is the core issue set, folks. And they're going to be listening to the answers from Blankenship and Morrissey and Jenkins to the questions that you and Brett put to them next week very carefully. Words will matter, positions will matter. And if these folks detect any whiff of squishiness or back down a toot or anything like that, uh, they will be unforgiving. They yeah. want to have a champion, a Trumpian champion in the United States Senate. I mean, Don Blankenship makes a good point in that, you know, two of his opponents, including uh, Joe Manchin, if he gets the opportunity to run against him, have been working on West Virginia politics for a really long time. And things, you know, in terms of the numbers have not been going all that well. As an outsider, he may have a good pitch. Well, West Virginia has been poor for a long time. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are rich in spirit. We are rich in culture. We are rich in many things. But uh, we have been a poor state for a very long time. And I would submit that the previous senator, the, the, the person who Joe Manchin replaced in the United States Senate, served there for 54 years, throughout that. all of which West Virginia was a poor state. So I would just point out that Manchin is well-liked in this state. He's in the wrong party, but he is going to be a very, very tough out because he is well-known, he is well-liked, and people in West Virginia are comfortable with sort of dynastic politics where you have multiple generations or you have people who are in office for a long time. Yeah. It's a high comfort level, and Manchin's going to have to be counting on those old ties and allegiances to weather the Trump storm. Well, we have a high comfort level with you, and we're glad that you're going to be with us in West Virginia. We're looking forward to it. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Good to see you. Can't wait. So West Virginia's GOP Senate debate Tuesday night on Fox News Channel. It's really the kickoff of the whole midterm season. We're going to do several of these across the country with uh, me, yours truly, and Brett Baer moderating these. We're going to be live in Morgantown on May 1 at 6.30 Eastern time. Do not miss it. So Tim Piazza was killed in a hazing incident at Penn State last year, but his legacy lives on, and we will speak to a boy who has received a gift from Tim that was life-saving. Plus, can Chip and Joanna Gaines really have it all? A USA Today op-ed says, nope. Rachel Campos Duffy is the mother of eight and no stranger to reality TV. She has something to say about that next. Whee! Dude, watch out. Daddy's pulling this mantle off the wall. We're Chip and Joanna Gaines. Look how strong he is. Oh. And we've made those out of reach neighborhoods reachable. We do it all. Over the last eight Chip and Joanna Gaines of the TV hit Fixer Upper have a huge business from the show to books to renovations and real estate. Now they even have restaurants and somehow they do it all with four kids and another one on the way. But a new op-ed in USA Today says don't believe it. The writer says they can't possibly be doing all that and putting family first. Daryl Austin of Utah writes this. Chip and Joanna Gaines did not get where they are by putting family first. You cannot do all they've done or even a fraction of it and still have any real time left over for family. There are a lot of people who wish they could be the next Chip and Joanna Gaines, but they're kidding themselves that they think they can achieve that kind of success and still give their children the time and attention they deserve. Whoa. Here now, Rachel Campos Duffy is a reality TV veteran and mother of eight and a Fox News contributor. Rachel, great to see you tonight. Thank you. What do you think of it? Well, first of all, I'm a huge fan of the show, so I was yeah. very interested in this article. Um, it doesn't surprise me that Chip and Joanne are being criticized because this is a very openly out there Christian couple, and so they're taking some of the attacks, I think, partially because of that. But look, uh, the guy brings up a, a, a point, like, how do they do it all? Well, some people are more talented than others. In the case of Chip and Joanne, they seem, everything they touch seems um, to turn to gold, and I think that they, um, first of all, aren't doing it all by themselves. These businesses are being run by a lot of people in their town. They're employing a lot of people. Um, they work hard. They're entrepreneurs. So I, I, I don't think that, you know, in Spanish we have a saying, it says, um, cada matrimonio y su familia es su mundo, which means every family and marriage is their own world. And how does this that guy... Is, I love that. It's, say that again. I cada, love that expression. Cada matrimonio y cada familia es su, es su, own, es su mundo, which means it's they're their own world. How does this guy purport to exactly. know what is going Going on in the Gaines house. Yeah, I mean, they figure out how to balance caring for their family, supporting their family, and finding time for their family, and they're making it work. And 
it's a constantly re, constant recalibration. I'm sure they're working hard at, at finding that right balance, just as you do, just as I do. And it, that was what struck me, and and that phrase, which I love, yes, put, nails it right on the head. Because the fact of the matter is that some people can handle a lot, yeah. and some people prefer to live life in a more pared down kind of simple way. Absolutely. Some people can handle a lot of chaos. They can balance it. And you know what? We all know when, when we try to handle a lot of things, which I do and you do, some weeks work better than others. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is certainly not a perfect plan no. by any stretch of the imagination. But to criticize them and to say something must be up. Now, who knows? I mean, maybe maybe they're, maybe it will all explode. You know, maybe it's sure. not what it appears to be. Sometimes that happens. But I don't know who this guy is, you know, telling them that from afar, he's decided that they are not putting their family first. Absolutely. And remember, this is a couple that works together. So they, yeah. as a couple, work together. Um, they don't live in New York City. They live in rural, uh, small town, rural America, which logistically, I know from having a big family and living in small town America, it's just easier. I think it, I, I've come to New York with all my kids and I would go, I can't do it here. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a little different. There's all kinds of stuff. They have extended family that helps them. And again, they're employing a lot of people in their town. They're making their town better um, instead of tearing this particular family down I think America should look at them and say wow this is these people are hardworking yeah, they're good teaching you, their kids you know, go for ethic. it I, I, you had your expression mine is God only gives you what you can handle right I so if you can more. handle you know a, a smaller scale situation perfect you know if you can take on what they're taking on and if you can do it in a loving way and raise your family you know more power to them. More power to them. And I think that there's, you know, there's lots of HGTV shows about people fixing up their houses. There's only one Chip and Joanne show. And I think the authenticity and the love that they have is real. You can't fake that. Um, they've been very open about they put faith, their marriage, and then their kids and in yeah. that order. And this guy they says, well, he wanted to work. expand his business and decided he, he didn't want to do that because he wanted to have uh, more time with his family. Good for you, sir. <laughs> That's your choice. And more power to you. Rachel, That's thank right. you very much. Thanks, Martha. Good to see you as always. Thank you. Coming up next this evening, Timothy Piazza's parents making sure that his dreams still come true despite his tragic death at Penn State. Creating a foundation in his name, they have dedicated it to those who need prosthetics and can't afford them. This precious picture, this child from New Jersey is the first recipient. Lamont and his mom join me with their story of the gift that Tim Piazza gave this little boy next. I know that you have a foundation that you're trying to, and what do you want to do with that foundation? Well, we, um have dedicated some of it for high school scholarships at Tim's High School. And uh, the bulk of it is pretty much dedicated to funding prosthetics for people who can't afford it, especially children and potentially soldiers, because that's what Tim really wants to do with his mechanical engineering degree. That was Evelyn Piazza here on The Story back in February. She was talking about the Timothy J. Piazza Memorial Foundation that was set up in memory of her son, who died in February of 2017 after a night of hazing at a Penn State fraternity. The sophomore wanted to be an engineer, and he wanted to develop prosthetics for those who couldn't afford them. Now his parents are keeping his dream alive. Through their foundation, the Piazzas were able to pay for a prosthetic leg for a seven-year-old boy who lost the lower part of his leg in a tragic school bus accident. Lamont Hanna received this cool Batman prosthesis two months ago, and his mom says he is already back to being a kid again. Here now, Lamont Hanna and his mother, Wakia Williams. Good to see both of you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Hello, Lamont, and hello, Thank Wakia. Um, Wakia, let me hello. start with you. Tell us a little bit about what happened and, and what... Uh, Lamont's reaction was and how worried you all were about what was, what was his future, what his future was going to be like. Well, he was um, exiting off his bus and another bus hit him. Mm. And during that trans um, during the action, he lost his, the bottom part of the leg at the scene. No, ma, ma, ma. I didn't lock my leg. No, you didn't lose your leg. He, well, he lost his foot. He wants me yeah. to correct. He was his foot on the scene. And through that, the Parasa fam, the, the foundation reached out to us and they rewarded Lamont with a very cool Batman leg. But before the accident, we weren't sure, was he able to walk again? Will he be able to walk again? That was my biggest worry. Would he be able to walk again? Because 
to lose your I foot. Don't know why. That's the main part of walking. So we were hello, extremely mom. Hello, excited. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Lamont's listening because you can hear your mom and you can hear me. So Lamont, this question is for you. Okay, uh, how did you feel when you found out that you were going to get this Batman prosthetic that would help you to walk again? Excited. You were excited about it. He was very happy. And was it hard to learn how to walk with it? Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, I was I was running pretty good. I used to I, I used to I used to run, but I used to run. But now you can't run as fast. I can't run as fast as my friends. Oh, and now you can't run as fast as your friends. But it's okay. But now you have a leg, right? But she said, what did you like about it the most? What did you like about your leg the most? That the you Batman. The Batman? <laughs> <laughs> so, Wakia, tell me, tell me a little bit, Wakia, about meeting the Piazza family and, and how you, you all were connected. Uh, I was I was excited. I was elated to meet her. Just the fact that she would just take the time out to come meet us mm -hmm. and that she would take the time out to even put forth a foundation to help people that she doesn't even know. So I was, I, I actually Googled her before she came and met her. I Googled her, so I was just like so excited to meet her. And I was so thankful, like just really honestly thankful because without her, my son wouldn't have had the opportunity to walk again. And I can, I can, I can never repay her for that. Like never. I know like, you, that you said that is like, that the the fact that you know they had such a tragedy that happened in their lives and that they're they're using it to make someone else's life your little boy Lamont's life better I, I actually said a miracle I said they're mm -hmm. using their tragedy to give miracles because it's a miracle to be able to give someone uh, the opportunity to be able to walk again we take <sighs> that kind of stuff for granted to where now he, it's a necessity to be able to wear, I have to carry him around, you understand? If he wasn't, if he wouldn't no, have had a prosthetic, we would have to carry him around. You know, so it's a blessing. He's a blessing. <laughs> Lamont yes, he is an adorable boy, he, and I thank you so much. And I bet you're going to be able to run and keep up with your friends before you know it, okay, buddy? Thank you so much, Wakia and Lamont. Thank Great you to see so both much. Of you tonight. Thank you so much for having us. It's thank our you pleasure. so much. Thank you. All the best to you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Up next, this little guy now has a name, and it is quite a long history behind it. The backstory on Louie, next.